We're delighted to have with us today Brother James Andrews from Alabama. Uh, he is a great gospel preacher, and when I was reflecting on the, the subject of the Book of Romans in preparing this lectureship, I knew that we needed to have an introduction to the book, and James was the first one that came to mind. He has a bachelor's degree in mathematics and physics from Jacksonville State University, and he also has a master's degree in Bible from Ambridge University, which is in uh, Montgomery, Alabama. He has served as a local preacher in the states of Alabama and Georgia and Tennessee. And while working with the East Tallahassee Church in Alabama, he helped develop mission programs, especially so in the Caribbean, or some call it the Caribbean, and primarily in the uh, country of Jamaica. And James has become well known for his efforts in mission uh, endeavors. Uh, we were privileged to go with him and several others to uh, Europe in, in 2008 uh, to do some uh, preaching and teaching there. And he was uh, uh, our rescuer getting on those fast trains that we rode over there. If it hadn't been for Brother Andrews, why, well, Fran and I just wouldn't have made it. We couldn't keep up with him. But nonetheless, he uh, does commendable work wherever he goes, and I know that you're going to profit greatly by hearing him uh, give us an introduction to the book. Brother Gene Smith said, I, I had to come this morning to hear how he's going to cover the whole book of Romans in 38 minutes, and that, that is a chore, but if anyone can do it, Brother Andrews can. James? Thank you, Brother Maxie, and good morning, friends. Only a few years after Jesus' sacrifice for sin, our Lord knocked at Ananias' heart door in Damascus, gave him a chilling message. Arise and go to the street that is called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. Ananias respected the omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent God. But he believed at this moment God didn't have all the information. And he told God about that. Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he's come here to arrest me and others like me. It's just a piece of information the Lord needed. But the Lord said, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. Now, I wonder how long God had known that he was going to select Saul of Tarsus to do that. Maybe before the foundation of the world. I don't know, but he was a ready man from Tarsus, a great city in Asia Minor. Tarsus had been recognized as a great city for 2,000 years. The Persians and all of those people that traveled the seas were concerned about having Tarsus. It was protected on the north by the Taurus Mountains. On the south, there was the Mediterranean Sea. It was on the Sidonus River near the mouth of it, only 10 miles inland. It was a great city. Antiochus Epiphanes made it a part of the Greek colonies. And when Rome took over, it became a part of Roman of the Roman Empire. And then it was made a free city, a gift that was something to be desired. The Hittites, the Assyrians, Persians, Seleucids, Romans, all knew that Tarsus was a great city, and they desired it. There's something else in Tarsus. Goats, goats all over the place. Goats with coarse black hair that could be woven into great cloth that could be made into tents. 
And every would-be rabbi had to learn a trade that would support his family. Saul of Tarsus learned a trade. At the age of 12, he went to Jerusalem, we believe, as a teenager anyway, enrolled at the school of Gamaliel, met Jesus, we don't know, but he might have. He sat in judgment later at the execution of a Christian named Stephen. And when that last stone was thrown at Stephen, Saul of Tarsus was like a young wolf who had had his first taste of blood. He was ready to fight. Went to the chief priest, desired of him letters that he might go to Damascus and bind Christians. He got those immediately, and guess what? Something was to happen on that trip to Damascus that would be devastating to the Jewish faith. Beyond Saul of Tarsus' wildest imaginations, Saul knew little about the cross, knew little about Jesus Christ, knew little about his church. When Ananias, with his hands, took him, pushed him under the baptismal waters, that hungry, tired, thirsty Saul of Tarsus baptized into Christ. He began to preach immediately, went into the synagogues in Damascus to convict the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. Some of the Jewish leaders wouldn't tolerate that and lay in wait for him. The disciples led him over the wall. He went into the Arabian desert and caught up into the third heaven where he learned about Christ and his church and the cross. And he came out to do the work of Christ. On his second missionary journey, he stopped at a place called Corinth, the most wicked place in the world, probably. Decided he wouldn't stay there, and God said, stay there. I have much people in this city. For 18 months, he labored in Corinth. On the third missionary journey, he went back. And he labored there again for another 18, another five months, three months. What does the book of Romans do? A lot of things. We know this. It presents a systematic theology of the Christian doctrine. Nothing had ever been written to do that. And of course, by this time, there had been no systematic treatise, and the church was almost 30 years old. It publicized the gospel to the world. It presented Christ as the means of salvation. Barclay Newman and Eugene Nida said this. If the Apostle Paul had written nothing else, he would still be recognized as one of the outstanding Christian thinkers of all time on the basis of this Roman letter alone. Amen. What a great, fascinating letter it is. Chapter 1. After a personal greeting, Paul announced, I am a debtor both to the Greeks, to the barbarians, both to the wise and unwise, as much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to those that are in Rome also. He is writing this letter from Corinth. He is writing this letter in the winter of AD 55, 56. He sees it, the Holy Spirit guides him as a theology of salvation. It's a solution to the sin problem. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, he said in Romans 1. It's the power of God to salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. What, what are the results of paganism? Results of paganism, great governments, great economy, great everything else? No, no, no. Because they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, he gave them up to vile affections. And listen to this. For even their women exchanged the natural use of, their, of what is against nature. Likewise, also men leaving the natural use of women burned in their lust one to another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. You got it. There's the end result of paganism. Now, ask the Jews, though. All of these sins you're talking about, ultimately, the sin of homosexuality, the practice of it. Are we guilty of any of those things? Absolutely not. We are Abraham's seed. We have Moses' law. We, we, God doesn't see us as being that kind of people. Chapter 2. Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, Whoever you are who judge, who is he talking to? The Jews. 
For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast of the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you Jews. For it is written, for, for circumcision is indeed profitable for you if you keep the law. <clears throat> but if you're a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Ouch. We knew the Gentiles were wicked. We didn't know we were. Chapter 3. Do the Jews have any advantage over the Gentiles? Absolutely. They had the law. They knew the law. They read the law in their synagogues. They kept the law before their children. Did they have any advantage over the Gentiles? Yes. They knew God better. Did the Ten Commandment law make them righteous? Absolutely not. Paul says not at all. Uh, we have previously charged both Jew and Gentile that they're all under sin for it is written there is none righteous no not one all have sinned and come short of the glory of God the book of Acts is a history book it clearly demonstrates our response to God's plan of salvation on Pentecost those people said men and brethren what shall we do and Peter said unto them repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises to you, to your children, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. It's a great statement. But Peter didn't explain how it worked. He just said it works. You want to get rid of your sins? You repent of your sins and be baptized, and it will work. But see, the book of Romans explains how it works down in about verse 24 of chapter 3 being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. In other words, reason would seem to think that God could not be just and justify sinners at the same time. Paul said, put the blood of Christ in the mix. Put Jesus Christ there. And you'll see that God paid the penalty for sin and remained just while he was doing it. Now that flies in the face of salvation by merit. It flew in the face of Judaism. It flew in the face of philosophy. And it still flies in the face of Judaism because they believe that one is saved by merit. Still flies in the face of philosophy because most philosophers believe that we're made better by merit. Flies in the face of political entities that say you can raise yourself by your own bootstraps. It won't work. Chapter 4. What then shall we say? That Abraham our father has found according to the flesh. For if Abraham were justified by works, that is by merit, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He, he, he didn't waver. He didn't separate himself from God. At the promise of God through unbelief. But strengthened, was strengthened in the faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was able to perform. Now, now what, does that, what effect does that have on us? Abraham believed God. Oh, yes, he, he did have to cope with that thing about you're going to have a son from your own loins and from Sarah. But, but he never separated himself from God. He never wavered. But what does that have to do with us? Chapter 5, being justified by faith, we have peace 
with God our Father, through whom we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. God did indeed demonstrate his love toward us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. We have one man's sin unto death. We have one man's righteousness unto life. Because of Jesus Christ, the gift of grace abounded to many. And listen, moreover the law entered, this is in verse 20 of chapter 5, that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Uh, did I read that right? Where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Where, where there's a lot of sin, there's a lot of grace. If a man has a lot of sin, God has a lot of grace for him. That's kind of wonderful, isn't it? The more we sin, the more grace we have. Right? So the moral of this story is, the conclusion is, let's be big sinners so we can have big grace. Well, you know what Paul said about this. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Chapter 6. Certainly not. How shall we who are dead to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that so many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we're buried with him through baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, we also should walk in newness of life. And later on, therefore let not sin reign in your mortal body that you obey its lusts. Is that all mixed up? No. The whole context here says where people are ranked sinners, God reaches out and gives them grace and they can be saved. Among Christians, God gives grace, but not to those who continue in sin because we died to sin when we were baptized and he does not save the rebellious sinner. We're baptized into Christ. We're justified by faith. The book of Romans teaches justification by faith. It also teaches baptism into death. Why justification by faith and baptism into death in this same book? Because sin merits death. Baptism is faith reaching out for God's grace. And we missed it. When I say we, I don't necessarily mean you. But the denominational world has missed that idea. Justification by grace is good, they say. Justification by faith is good. But baptism is no good. It just puts us into a visible relationship with Christ. Sin's already removed. I tell Saul of Tarsus that who was told that he needed to be baptized to wash away his sins. And tell him that when he says, we're baptized into death. Not only do we die, we're baptized into the benefits of death, of the death of Christ. And of course, that is justification by faith. We're freed at baptism, raised to walk in newness of life, being delivered from the law, we become slaves of God. Chapter 7. The business of the law is not to condemn, is not to commend or forgive. It is to identify sin and judge the sinner. Do you think this fair city would put policemen at stop signs with the order to give $10 gift certificates to everyone who stopped? Not at all. It's the hundredth person who doesn't stop that the law points a finger at and say, you give us some money. That's what the law is for. The law is to find the violator and punish the violator. The law is not to reward the violator. No law is to reward, reward, reward the violator. It doesn't work that way. So here we have the necessity of law. The law of God is perfect. Why then does Paul cry out, I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died, and the commandment which was to bring life I found to death. 
for sin taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. The law is bad. No, no, no. Law is not bad. The law with its commandment identified sin. And because sin was there, then it did what it was supposed to do. Paul used the first person pronoun here when he says I, 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 about whom is Paul speaking. I think he's speaking of himself. I think himself represents the Jewish nation. And I think himself represents all people that come under law. Because law does something for an individual or to an individual. Everyone who reaches maturity, Paul, for example, through the commandment, recognize sin to be exceedingly sinful. Sometimes we think of little sins and big sins. We think of, of, of sins that don't amount to much and sins that amount to a lot. But Paul said, the law reminds me that sin is exceedingly sinful. And when we say, ah, that doesn't amount to much. That's a minor thing. Don't worry about that thing. Paul said the law condemns it, so you need to worry about it. That's what the law is for. And it says this is a sin. But the law does something else. Not only does it identify sin, but it increases the natural man's attraction to sin. If you go back and think of children, when you tell them not to do something, what do they want to do? They want to do it. I could give 10,000 examples of this, but won't give a one because all the adults in the audience understand. Think about adults. When adults learn that something is off limits, then they want to participate in it. I used to ship equipment to the Caribbean, and I wanted to put on some sophisticated electronic equipment uh, as I had insured it, insured item. Airline said, no, no, don't do that. Don't put insured item on here because somebody will tear into it and take it. It's an attraction to them. You know, they can violate the law. Paul was desiring one kind of conduct, duct, and he was practicing, practicing another. For what I will do, I do not practice. But, but what I hate, that I do. That's human nature. That's the way we are, represented all of mankind. But the power of the law, which condemns one under the law, is abrogated by the cross of Christ. A person dies to the law as he is baptized into Christ. John says the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Uh, then, preacher, you're saying that law and grace are mutually exclusive. Not at all. Law is absolutely necessary to our conduct. So, but since sin does not control the Christian, we're not under condemnation, but we are free. John said if we have fellowship one with another, uh, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. So that frees us from the law because we are subject to Jesus Christ and cleansed by his blood. Chapter 8. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. How can this be? Look at chapters 3 and 4. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Complicated? I think it is. But why shouldn't it be? Because God is doing it. And God is doing a big thing. And God is a God that we cannot fully understand. But we do understand this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So who can separate us from the love of God? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. 
None of these things, for we're all conquerors through him who loved us. Chapter 9, Paul is grieved because his Jewish brothers, for the most part, are rejecting salvation and makes a statement that we've considered over the years, for I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, and to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, and the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises. Paul, did I hear you say that you would gladly go to hell if your brothers could be spared? I don't think so. I think he says, you know, I, I love them so much, I could almost wish that I were accursed if it would save them. He's showing the intensity of his love. One of the most troubling passages in the Bible to me is found in John chapter 1, verse 11, as we're talking about the Christ and his coming to the earth. John said he came to his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become the sons of God, even to them who believe on his name. Why is that troubling? Because he came to his own, and his own received him not. He, he created his own. Not only did he create them in his image, as you and I are in his image, but he bore them through Abraham. He had that nation trained under a schoolmaster to bring them to him. They received him not. Paul, Paul goes on to say, it's not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Now that's confusing, isn't it? People in this audience are not all Texans who are Texans. That sounds contradictory. It's not. They are not all Israel who are Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. There's the point. Israel was a physical Israel, and then there was a spiritual Israel. Paul is talking about the spiritual Israel. Here's, here's, what, here's what he says. But in Isaac, your seed shall be called. Yes, they were a special nation, but it didn't amount to anything right now except they had the law. Because in Isaac your seed shall be called. Who can be called? Anyone. But those people who are of the physical seed of Abraham, they're going to be saved anyway. Paul said, absolutely not. Through Israel, or through Isaac, the seed will be called. Many events had to transpire before that could happen. God had to be involved in ways that we don't always understand and to fulfill his promises. And there comes the case about Jacob and Esau. Esau, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. Oh, I see. I see God being a person of partiality. I, I, I see that a contradiction. God is no respecter of persons, yet, yet, he, uh, yet he respected Jacob. He hated Esau. Well, let's understand one thing first. We're not talking about salvation here. We're talking about a role in humanity. We're talking about a bringing of the Son of God to earth. And somebody had to do it. It had to be through somebody. There were twin boys, and it couldn't go through both of them. <clears throat> and God said, I tell you what, I'm going to select Jacob. And I'm going to give Esau a lesser role. God is a potter. We are the clay. And then this thing about the Pharaoh comes up. You know, God raised up Pharaoh in order that he might demonstrate his power. That, that, that seems so horrible. Well, you notice the particular Pharaoh he raised up. We don't know his name, but we know what kind of guy he was. It was not Tutankhamun. He came later. God didn't wait for him because Pharaoh Tutankhamun might not have done what God wanted him to do. This other Pharaoh did. God is no respecter of persons. He simply selects men to do what has to be done. Jacob did it. Esau didn't. That particular Pharaoh became 
as God knew he would, and God showed his power through him. The Gentiles, who did not pursue righteousness, attained righteousness. The Jews, pursuing the law of righteousness, <coughs> did not attain it. Why? Because they stumbled at the stumbling stone, Jesus Christ. God is in essence saying, I put it there. And my people fell over it. And they backed off and said, we can't take that. It's not, that's not the way. He's not our king. We don't accept him. And we still don't, by the way, in our society today. Still look for the Messiah that will come in regal garments with, with all the paraphernalia meant for an earthly king. It's not going to happen. Oh, these people were zealous. Yes, they were, they were out of their minds to do that which is right for them. Chapter 10, brethren, my heart's desire, pray to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for the righteousness to everyone who believes. Since everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame, Paul lauds gospel preaching, quoting Isaiah, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel. Has God cast away his people? Chapter 11, of course not. Paul declares, for I'm an Israelite, the seed of Abraham, the tribe of Benjamin. I am not cast away. His people are not cast away. His people have withdrawn from him. This falling away of Israel allowed the Gentiles to enter. Israel and the Gentiles didn't like each other. When Israel pulled away, the Gentiles entered. And they became blessed. The olive branch was grafted in. And, and then Israel started looking and said, oh, we're being left out. They became jealous. So some of them wanted to be a part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And became a part. And Paul warns the Gentiles, don't you dare, don't you dare take issue with this. Because God used them to develop the root system. And to develop the, the vine. So you could be grafted in. You owe a lot to them. God has provided a way of salvation for you Romans, Jew and Gentile. How should you conduct yourself? Now that's... That's about the end of the heavy theology of the book of Romans. And I'm sure you didn't grasp all of it. But he continues and said, here's the way you ought to act. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Every Christian, Jew or Gentile, had his own measure of faith. He was to function according to his ability. Exercise of his gift, whether prophesying or teaching or exhorting, whatever, was to be without hypocrisy. He was to abhor evil. He was to cleave to that which is good. He was to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Overcome evil with good. That was a new commandment, no doubt to the Roman Christians. And chapter 13, live within the limits of the law. Let every soul be subject to government authorities. For there is no authority except from God. The authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinances of God. Those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. Why? Because civil powers are ordained of God and serve in the outreach of Christianity. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, God says. That even applies to non-Christians. And yet we are involved in creature comforts instead of edifying the body of Christ. 
chapter 14. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes that he may eat all things, but he, he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. Let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. Do not judge others by your personal subjective standards. God judges them. Who are you that judges your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we should all stand in judgment before the seat of Christ. See, it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God. We should function in a way in our daily lives that edifies fellow Christians and attracts those who are not Christians. Chapter 15, we who are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please our own selves. Jesus Christ became a servant to the circumcision. Cannot a Jewish Christian rejoice with the uncircumcision? The Gentile Christian makes sense. The Jewish Christian does not step down as far to the Gentile Christian as Jesus Christ stepped down to them. He became of the circumcision. Why can't they become of the uncircumcision? The Apostle Paul closes his book by recognizing Christians both in Rome and Corinth. I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Sincrea. You may receive her in the Lord and assist her whatever business she has need of you. For indeed, she has been a helper of many and of also myself. In that chapter, Paul presents more than 30 names of Christians. But listen to what he said about Priscilla and Aquila. Hope you've never missed this. He said they risk their own necks for my life. To whom not only I give thanks, but also all the church of the Gentiles. They risk their own necks for my life. Midway through that chapter, he makes a general statement. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. And now he closes. Now to him who is able to establish you, according to my gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, but, ha but now made manifest, and by prophetic scriptures made known to all nations, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, for obedience for the faith, to God alone wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. And I say, Amen. Oh, what marvelous mercy, what infinite love, what immense.